Go on, please. There was a time during the mid-2000s when more than a quarter of the world's construction cranes were thought to be located in Dubai. These cranes were involved in building a nation that many of us now associate with the Burj Khalifa and the Palm Islands. It's also a nation through which many people transit, typically having flown there on Emirates, Dubai's national carrier. Sports fans will be familiar with Emirates, which has been extensively involved in sports sponsorships for more than a decade, with the likes of Real Madrid and Arsenal. Dubai in the 21st century is part of the world's popular imagination. It's a place to go on holiday, a place to go shopping, and a lucrative revenue source for some of the world's biggest sports teams and events. The nation's emergence isn't accidental, rather it has been state-led and state-funded. Indeed, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, government continue to spend big money in an attempt to support Dubai's now well-established global prominence. In one instance, Emirates was given $2 billion, some of which will presumably find its way into the coffers of sports properties with which the company has sponsorship contracts. The reasons for Dubai's huge investments, both generally and in sport, are multiple. They're a way of putting revenues derived from oil and gas deposits to good use. Furthermore, by investing in sectors such as sport, the hope is that the nation can industrially diversify. This is especially important in an age where oil prices are low and anti-carbon sentiment has grown dramatically. Yet there's something especially compelling about sport. It's distinctive and has a power that enables countries to nation brand, to project soft power and to engage in international diplomacy. Dubai is home to the International Cricket Council, hosts an important Rugby Sevens tournament and even has its own sports city in which world-class sports facilities are located. Dubai's brand has become firmly positioned in the minds of fans, the media, sponsors and investors. Here is a home for sport that rivals the world's other centres of sport, even London and New York. And with this brand positioning comes a soft power effect. Soft power is attractive power, a way of engaging key target audiences by persuading them that you share their values and want the same things as they do. Yet power, whether soft or otherwise, is always about securing what a country wants. In Dubai's case, sport provides both visibility and legitimacy, and one can see how this works whenever people discuss the airline Emirates. There's no mention of migrant worker abuses or human rights issues. Instead, what most people see is a glamorous, lavishly funded array of high-profile sports sponsorship deals across the world. Critics nevertheless argue that what Dubai is engaged in is not constructive international relations and building pro-social relationships. Instead, they label such investments as sport washing, a deliberate attempt to distract attention away from the country's crimes and misdemeanors. Whether a soft power play, an attempt to deflect or otherwise, Dubai's involvement in tennis embodies the global debate about why the nation is engaged with sport. As the skyscrapers rose in the mid-2000s, Roger Federer played Andre Agassi on the roof of the Burj Al Arab Hotel, 1,000 feet up in the air. Some people still refer to the game as the coolest tennis match in history. Indeed, the iconography of it still endures in the minds of many. What may seem cool is, nevertheless, what drives nation branding and soft power projection. But it's also spawned a multi-million dollar industry in Dubai. Dubai now plays host to innumerable tennis centers and clubs, which include the likes of Hit With The Pros, Junior High Performance, and Adult Tennis Social Night. In addition to the economic bonanza tennis has become, the sport also helps to promote social cohesion in what are often disparate local communities living in the Emirates. And if one of these clubs eventually yields a highly ranked Dubai professional, then presumably the government will see it both as a return on their investment and an instrument through which political messaging can be channeled. But it's not just a desire for cohesion and professional tennis success that Dubai craves. As in the case of football, the Emirates airline is omnipresent in professional tennis. The carrier has sponsored all of the Grand Slams apart from Wimbledon and is the ATP's premier partner in a deal that runs to 2025. The Grand Slams in New York, Paris and Melbourne help to connect the dots on an airline network map that inevitably routes through the Gulf, helping to further strengthen Emirates' strategic positioning. Elite professional tennis is also laden with status and prestige, which neatly, though not uncoincidentally, enhances Dubai's appeal and soft power. Emirates also sponsors the Dubai Tennis Championship, a tournament that tells the story of a nation and its transformation, but also betrays a darker side to the image that Dubai wants the world to see. 
The championship began in 1993 as an ATP 250 level tournament, played on hard courts, in front of crowds numbering no more than 3,000 in total, all sat in temporary grandstands. Yet as Dubai's wealth became apparent and the government started spending money, so the stars of tennis began flocking in. In 2001, the world was taken aback when construction of the Palm Jumeirah mega project began and the true scale of Dubai's ambitions became apparent. In the same year, the championship became a 500-level tournament. The country's role on the global tennis calendar seemed to be developing just as quickly as the country's physical infrastructure. With Dubai fast emerging as the destination of choice for the globally affluent and sun-seeking tourists, the championship announced in 2005 that it would be the first tennis tournament, other than the US Open and Australian Open, to award equal prize monies for men and women. This singled out the country as being distinct from its more conservative near neighbours, such as Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi. It also suggested that sport had become a means through which the country could bring about social change, not least through the promotion of equality between women and men. However, by 2009, skeptics were questioning whether the new Dubai was perceived rather than real. The Burj Khalifa's exterior was finished that year, yet for all its glitz, glamour and status, the country nevertheless revealed some aspects of its politics and society hadn't kept pace with its broader ambitions. That year, Israeli tennis player Shah Pia was denied a visa to play at the Dubai Tennis Championship. There were strong rumours at the time that another Israeli player, Andy Ram, would also be denied entry. Eventually, Ram was given special permission to enter the country following representations made by a United States congressman. This didn't stop the 2008 defending champion, Andy Roddick, withdrawing from the men's event in protest. Nor did it stop the Women's Tennis Association fining the tournament organizers $300,000. Pia responded to her exclusion by stressing, I think a red line has been crossed here that could harm the purity of sport. I have always believed that politics and sport should not be mixed. In turn, Pia's manager, Shlomi Pia, argued that her exclusion was on the grounds of her nationality. Francesco Ricci Bitti, president of the International Tennis Federation, responded by saying, The ITF believes sport should not be used as a political tool, but rather as a unifying element between athletes and nations. Given the recently agreed normalization of relations between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, it seems unimaginable that such incidents will happen again anytime soon. Indeed, such is the dynamic nature of current Middle Eastern affairs, there are even rumors of UAE investors acquiring a stake in Israeli football club Baitar Jerusalem, a club with a strongly nationalist fan base. In Dubai's Zabil Park, there is a large work of public art called The Frame, completed in 2018 and now the world's largest empty picture frame. Some people might call it a folly, others a symbol of excess, but for many it enables them to view a confident city-state where new buildings, iconic landmarks and, for that matter, sport provide the canvas. Dubai is still ascending, hence its planned staging of World Expo 2020, which will now take place in 2021 as it continues to build its identity, status and legitimacy. Sport helps in this regard, yet no matter how the landscape is viewed or whatever is built, it seems that tennis in the Emirates will always be an uneasy mix of money, business, politics and regional feuds.